Okay, um, so everyone can hear me. Um, so um, I get to kick off this event by talking about uh, one of the areas of science communication that I'm very passionate about, which is actually um, talking about our science mostly to the public uh, in a way that gets them engaged and involved and interested. So the title of my talk is Sharing the Excitement, Science Communication at NASA. And as I said, I'm mostly going to focus on um, oral presentations. All right, um, one of the things that I like to do is use the words of others. And so I'm going to start this talk with um, a quote from Carl Sagan, who is one of the, uh, at least in the, the United States, one of the best science communicators and an example of an excellent scientist that has really connected, uh, or really did connect through his career with the public. We have also arranged things so that almost no one understands science and technology. This is a prescription for disaster, and we certainly see that in my country, the US now, that people don't understand science, and it has become a critical time in, in our history uh, where this is impacting everything that we do because of a lack of understanding of a lot of technology and science. We might get away with it for a while, but sooner or later, this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our faces. And I'd argue maybe we've reached that time um, now. And so we need to um, move forward and, and take this challenge in hand. I'm going to talk about, as I mentioned, oral presentations. Uh, one of the things that I did at NASA was organize, through the British Council, um, a event called FameLab international uh, and I did this in the US and it was teaching scientists to be the ambassadors of science as opposed to bringing in people interested in science to speak for our scientists and so it was really important to train to train them and we brought in professionals and one of the concepts that we have adopted for science communication in the oral uh, format is that it's not only about speaking in a clear compelling and relevant manner nor simply about promoting findings. Effective science communication is about integrative process of understanding the audience and connecting with that audience. On their terms, not just yours, it requires listening as well as talking. And so I'm gonna give you an example of it. I'm the head of the astrobiology program. One of the things that we're really interested in doing is um, understanding the origin and evolution of life here on Earth so that we can develop tools to look for life beyond Earth. So if I wanted to explain to the public how I'd go about this, what tools are needed to search for life? If I was in the US or Britain, um, I'm an English speaker, this is one of my heroes, Doctor Who, and I'd say, well, we need a, a sonic screwdriver. You know, th this is a tool that's carried by a, a time traveler that you know, pretty much does everything. It's, it's a weapon to something that's investigative, it opens doors, it, it detects things, it's an amazing tool. But it turns out the first time I made a reference to Doctor Who in Japan, the people I spoke to had no clue what I was talking about. <laughs> I asked someone driving a, a blue fit, a Honda, I got into the car and I said, wow, it's bigger on the inside than it looks. It's like a TARDIS. And he said, no, it's a fit. So I knew that reference didn't work at all. So recently, um, I thought, OK, maybe if I'm in Japan, I talk about um, Doraemon. He's got a 4D pouch. He can just dig in there and find a flashlight, a clock. Uh, you know, Maybe that's the kind of reference that I would use to engage with my audience about how to search for life. Um, of course, if I did this in the US, some of my fellow nerds would recognize this, but most of our populace wouldn't actually know what I was talking about. So maybe you think about something that's a little bit more universal. Most people know Dr. Spock. Most people understand a tricorder. And this is an example of a tool um, that most people would resonate with. So I've thought about my audience, and I've tried to make a reference that would be understood by, by uh, the people that I'm talking to. So this is the, you know, keeping up the, I am a nerd, <laughs> keeping up the reference with Star Trek. Um, we apply a, a, a technique of really developing interpretation. And what is interpretation? It's a mis mission-based communication process that forges emotional and intellectual connections between the interests of the audience and the meanings inherent in the resource. And I use this image here of the Horta and Spock communicating with, um, for those of you that know this episode, there were many forms of interactions that didn't work very effectively, like shooting it with a, a phaser and, um, uh, and, and going after its, its young, which 
Oops. Oh, I see how this works. OK. Um, uh, and, and finally, we needed to have a mind meld. You know, so again, how do you engage with your audience in a meaningful f uh, fashion? So we use this interpretive, whoops, backing up. We use this interpretive approach because our goals are to teach people scientific facts. We want them to actually understand the details of the science that we do. We're looking to change their behavior about science, and we're looking to start a conversation. So you know, you can tell um, all of these things go together to generate a better understanding of science um, for, for the, the public in particular. In doing so, we have to consider some things about our brain. So this is a book by John Medina called Brain Rules. And some of the most important rules that we need to consider as you develop a message is that every brain is wired differently. You know that because of that, people receive information differently. And so sometimes to explain a concept to someone, you have to take multiple approaches. Uh, some people also are more visual, more, um, you know, or respond better to audio or, or uh, something dem demon uh, demonstrated to them as opposed to written. So um, we need to keep that in mind. We also know, and this is not surprising, people don't pay attention if it's boring. So, you know, first rule, don't be boring. Uh, in addition, we know that if you stimulate more of the senses, that information is retained. Uh, so, for instance, um, you know, adding a, a, you know, smell is a very powerful tool, or a very powerful sense. And sometimes, you know, for, for myself, my very first boyfriend, his mother washed his clothes in very strong detergent, and every time I smell that detergent, I blush. You know, this is a memory that I just can't get rid of, and that was from 40-some years ago. Of all senses, vision is superior to all other senses. So that's where we take in most of our information. Keep that in mind. And not surprisingly, re repetition uh, helps build memory. You tell them again and again. And you know, the, the rule for actually giving a presentation, even if it's for in a science conference, is you begin by telling them what you're going to tell them. You tell them what you're telling them. And then you remind them what you just told them five minutes ago. This really helps build memory. The other thing that's important, uh, particularly for I work for an agency, we have many audiences that I'll talk about in a second, but we really want to go beyond um, just, um, well, we have a process for thinking about how we engage the public, and it's, it's part of social marketing uh, theory. You basically start by dragging them along. You need to understand this. I'm spending lots of money on this mission, and you must know what this is about. You want to stimulate them, their, um, whoops. OK. You want to move up the, the ladder uh, to the curiosity. So you're piquing their, their curiosity. And so they're now, you know, oh, this is interesting. You enhance, thank you, I prefer that. <laughs> You enhance the awareness so you know they've read something, you've said something to them, they see the word again, and suddenly it's, it, they're aware of it, so they're going to be more interested in, in looking into that. You develop an understanding. You make them care about it so they actually not just aren't, aren't just passive, and if something goes by that has the word, say, space in it, they look at it, but they actually go online, do searches, so they're now actually caring about it. And then, then they care for it, or they feel a stewardship towards it. And the level that that represents in science communication is they become communicators as well. Now they're out there telling their neighbor that they just saw something fantastic that NASA did. And you should really, this is a great, go vote for somebody that, that, that is, is supportive of NASA. So now they actually care about the science that you do. And so if we went through, we don't need to go through that. Whoops, wrong direction. Excuse me. I always think it's funny when I mess up technology. Yes, I'm from NASA, but I don't build the rockets. <laughs> it's probably good. So we partnered. I mentioned that we did FameLab. It's, it's uh, uh, one of the very first, starting in 2007, one of the very first science communication competitions that was run by the British Council. Uh, its participants uh, include 25 different countries. As I mentioned, it was started in 2007, and now there's all sorts of versions of this. It basically is helping 
uh, scientists develop the equivalent of an elevator talk. You only have three minutes, the time that it takes to go up into to your apartment um, to tell the person next to you what it is you do and why they should care about it and, and really engage. So, uh, And then there, the, the message is developed and judged based on its content because you want to make sure you're not dumbing things down. You're not telling them nothing. You're actually telling them some real science, but you're telling it in a very clear way. So clarity is important, and you're doing it with charisma, which is really just about how you connect to somebody. You don't have to be a jokester. You don't have to be um, you know, particularly entertaining. But what you have to do is understand how to make a connection with the audience. And so we brought in a, 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 a couple that uh, run um, an institute about uh, interpretation. And they have the heart approach. This is their company that science communication should be holistic, engaging, appropriate, rewarding, and thematic. And I'm going to go through all of those. So holistic. Why should I care about this? You have to establish relevance. And everything that you do to establish relevance, again, I'm talking about an oral presentation. You have to put your props together, your appearance, your style, the actual message. Nothing is distracting. It's all adding together to forge your message. So a holistic approach. It's engaging. I mentioned you don't have to be uh, you know, a, a comedian to be successful in science communication. You just need to make a connection with your audience. And that can be emotional, intellectual. You're, you're the one, though, that is in control of making those connections. You need to get their attention and hold it. Uh, and to get them to think, in order to have them think more deeply uh, and understand. So, Giving people lots of, of facts isn't a real connection. Making them wonder about those facts does start making that connection because you're stimulating their, the part of their brain that, that, that includes their curiosity and, and will result in additional questions that they have. This is an example of one of our speakers from who had a prop, um, again, putting this together to engage his audience. Your message needs to be appropriate to the specific audience. You don't want to talk about Doctor Who in Japan. You don't want to talk about Doraemon in, in the US, necessarily. Uh, and, and again, remembering that you're addressing multiple learning styles. Our brains are wired differently. And so you need to be much more than just a simple talking head. You need to engage multiple senses uh, and uh, to, to take into account the needs of your audience. For me, in my job at NASA, my audiences include legislators and policymakers, foundation staff, um, donors, administrators, colleagues, and the broader public. And each, you can imagine how each of them are looking for a different kind of message from you as you talk to them about the science that you want to present. Uh, the legislators want to know, well, how can I tell my constituency why I would spend any money on this? Uh, foundation staff, again, wants to, wants to understand what kind of legacy are you promising me that, that I want to put my name to. Uh, same with things like donors. Uh, I have sometimes the most trouble explaining to people within my own agency why they should care and give money to the programs that I support at NASA. And so you have to make people really care and, and through an understanding of what matters to them. Just because you're really excited about it, and just, you know, convincing a legislator to give you money just because it makes you happy and you have a good time doing science is probably not the right approach. So you have to pay attention to who it is that you're speaking to. You need to uh, uh, demonstrate the reward for it. What are you trying to succeed, or what are you trying to achieve? How do you measure that success? So again, you, you always start out with what your goal is, what your outputs would be from that, what you want from the, as out, uh, outcomes, and ultimately what the impact is uh, in the end. And so just as a very quick example, if we had a goal to improve US student performance in math and science, there was an institute, the Ocean Discovery Institute, that uh, NOAA uh, put together to partner. Uh, and, and basically, this is a way that they uh, evaluated what it is that they were doing. Here were their outputs. They were going to invite City Heights children to do ecosystem restoration. Uh, again, a sense, hands on. We're just not telling you you need to save your ecosystem. You're going to take them out and show them this. 4,000 kids worked. That was an outcome. Uh, and the impact was 100 ocean leaders go to college as a result of this. So this is a program that they tracked. 
So again, their goal was to improve US student performance in math and science, which can be measured uh, as an indication of, um, by an indication of, of interest in science and, and completion of graduate or undergraduate degrees in science as a result of their exposure to this program. Your message needs to be thematic. There needs to be a central idea. You don't, you know, it's, um, you need to keep it simple in the sense that you're not hitting them with lots of information. I can tell you I wish there was a way to, for me to understand my trip here to Japan um, in a simple fashion. I've been feeling like I'm drinking from a fire hose. There's so much information coming in. And I realize that that's not, you know, it's not been effective for me. I'm overwhelmed and certainly wouldn't be effective for your audience. So you'd, you need to really be clear about a central theme have a couple sub-themes and stick to it. Don't wander off in different directions. Leaving you with uh, some, some ideas from Dr. Sam Ham. It sounds like he's a Dr. Seuss character, but he's not. <laughs> like green eggs, not really. Um, making a difference on purpose. So again, we're messaging about science because we want to make a difference and we're being very deliberate about it. So some key points. People remember themes. They generally forget facts. If you want them to eventually know the facts, remember that set of steps I had. At some point, you get them interested in the theme, you, get the, you stimulate their emotion about a topic, and they'll go and find the facts themselves. But you throw in the facts at them, they're not gonna, likely to, to remember that. Your job is to provoke them to want to understand more. If successful, the information will more likely be retained. And when we influence people's attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors, we sort of have them for life. So again, you have to think about the long game or you know, the, the, the longer goal of having them be engaged, care about, uh, and care for your science topic. And I'm gonna end with another uh, great quote. Any intelligent fool can make things bigger and more complex. And I would say that many, myself and many of my colleagues are intelligent fools. Uh, but it takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. And this is basically, you know, should be our um, philosophy in science communication. Be bold, be brave, uh, make it simpler and clear without losing the message and the importance of the science. And so with that, I'll end. Oh, I wanted to give credit to the people that helped develop this course for us, Tim Merriman and Lisa Brochu. Uh, and if you ever want someone who does an amazing set of training in science communication and interpretation, um, this is a plug for them. So thank you.